don't know what your view on the war on drugs is, right? But I see that one of that's one of the biggest problems of our police force nowadays. Um, as they sit there and they continually fight our brothers and our sisters out there and throw them in jail over this war on drugs, you know, we're wasting a lot of time and effort in promoting that instead of just letting it happen and go away on its own. It feels a lot like that prohibition thing. I, I think that, you know, my own personal views, um, that's a lot of Mexico's problem is our war on drugs. But um, I don't know. Do you have any comment on that? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, my personal view is uh, I think we're probably on the same page there. I, I also think it's a, a ridiculous uh, war on drugs. Um, you know, people can do all kinds of things, and as long as there's no victim and as long as what they're doing, they're doing responsibly, then there's no reason for that to be a crime. Um, you know, uh, if people want to ingest whatever drug it is and they take the steps to do so um, responsibly, then there's no harm, no foul. If they're harming themselves, well, you know, that's their body. They own their body. They should be able to do that if they want. Now, when, they come, when it comes along time for free health care, in my opinion, if they've been taking steps to harm their body, well, that's another issue. But until they get out into the road or into the public sphere where they're actually presenting a threat to somebody else mm. or they're harming somebody else, I, I, I see no, uh, the, no issue with that. Um, you know, we, we live in a diverse country and we have all kinds of different people with different values and beliefs and religions. You know, we're going to disagree with the decisions that other people make. That It just has to be that way. We shouldn't right. try to put everybody under the thumb. Instead, we should just try to live together. And it's pretty common sense that as long as what they're doing is not harming anybody else, then there's no reason for government to be involved in it. Um, now, right. uh, the flip side of that, to the drug wars, is the fact that by us, you mentioned prohibition, by the fact that we're you know, helping prop up this black market, where we are creating, uh, in my opinion, a national security threat through the drug cartels. They are uh, armed heavily, they are powerful, and you know, our democracy, our politicians, they tend to uh, give a little bit of sway to people who have money. If we get to the point where they are owned by the cartels, we're hosed. You know, this is a national security threat. This isn't just, you know, what your grandmother thinks because she goes to church and she thinks drugs are bad. You know, it's not a, just about that. This is a serious issue, and we really got to take a look at it, in my opinion. Right, right. You know, I think we are pretty much right on, on that one. And, um, yeah, actually, the, oh, what is it, last week, some guy ran his tractor over half the police force back east. Um, I forget what that was. You know, he ran over six police cars and one paddy wagon, um, effectively taking out 60% of their police force. Um, and he got in trouble over a bag of pot. And so all that was over a victimless crime. And... I don't know. I don't really support him going and destroying all that other stuff. But, you know, that war on drugs destroys lives. And so we don't know where he was coming at and the destruction that, you know, that victimless crime that he, you know, was being harassed for would have done to him. So what's the difference between a life and six cars? Right, you know, you, right. you can be pushed to a breaking point, and I'm seeing people more and more on that edge. That's why, you know, I think it's so important that we need to open our dialogues with our local law enforcement as to, you know, what's right and what's wrong, and these bad laws, like the the victimless crimes of, let's say, and I don't support drugs, screw that. You know, if you're stupid enough to spray something into a bag and suck it up into your lungs, then, hey, whatever, you know, or smoke crack in a pipe, that's your deal, dude. I'll let you go on your own. But, you know, it's their body, like you said. You know, let's back off. We're emboldening 
the folks down south where everything comes in, the drug cartels are just too strong, and they're oppressing their people. We're not allowing Mexico to grow up because we're using them as this drug supply. And, you know, I don't know. It's it's kind of crazy. Um, no, it's seriously crazy. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it, it's... It, you know, when you have oppressive laws and when you have the government peering in everybody's bedroom or regulating what they eat or ingest in their body, when you have this pressure, it's going to make people, you know, uncomfortable. And some people are going are gonna to lose their minds, unfortunately, like that guy who ran over the vehicles, you know, he, you know. I don't know his backstory, and you know, if it was uh, about having a bag of pot, then I think it's unfortunate that you know he's had problems with that. Um, but that doesn't justify, of course, vandalizing six Agreed. you know pieces Agreed. of uh, public property. You know, violence and or destruction. That's not the answer. And and that's and you're right though. We do need to have a dialogue because we need people on both sides of the issue who are concerned with America you know, concerned with America to figure this out because we don't want the bad cops on their side, you know, making the situation worse because they don't value America. They don't value the rule of law. And we don't need people on our side, you know, who are just regular, you know, taxpaying citizens who, you know, go off the deep end because they also don't value the rule of law. You know, it's one thing to be wrong. It's another thing to, to do wrong because you were wrong, you know. So it's it's a complicated issue, and, uh, you know, tempers and mm. the run and pressure is out there, and we all need to, sit, we need to have a dialogue, and we need intelligent people on both sides to discuss how to take care of this problem for America. Mm, yeah. Hey, we speaking of dialogue, we just lost one caller, but we still have one. Let's see if they want to talk to us. Hold on a second. Let's push this button here and see if it's actually doing something. Hmm. Kind of curious. It looks like this one's out of Fredericksburg. Eh, come <laughs> on. Let's go. Uh, sorry, person in Fredericksburg. I'm pushing the button, honestly. Let's go. Can you hear me? Can you I hear me can, now? I can hear you. Who yeah, I'm out of Fredericksburg. I'm I'm on I'm out of Fredericksburg because you asked me to call in. This is Richard Mack, Sheriff Mack. Ah, uh, hey, Sheriff, Sheriff Mack. Mack. <laughs> hey, good of you to call. Hey, well, um, thanks. Uh, so here's the question for you: Are you familiar with uh, peaceful streets at all? Have you heard about that stuff going on in Austin? Uh, n- not until your email came to me. Uh, I would hope that. Uh, we're all trying to have peaceful streets. I don't know if that's anything new or if it's the project, if it's a old name to a new kind of project. Uh, I'm not sure what they're trying to accomplish by it or if they're going to. Uh, well, let, let's they're... run that. We'll run the story for you real quick. You want to tell them about it, okay. uh, Rick, or do you want me to do it? Sure, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, peaceful Streets is an organization that was made by uh, Antonio Beeler with the help of uh, some other individuals in Austin. It was uh, sparked by an unlawful arrest that uh, Antonio had, but essentially, what oh, he's I know, done, I, I'm, I know Antonio. He's a real good guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, what they're doing is they're arming citizens and they're training citizens with cameras and video technology, and they're actually um, having these individuals go out in teams and uh, just record police. And when they have uh, something noteworthy, then they, they post it for everybody to see, uh, including uh, there was one uh, video of a cop that, uh, or a couple of cops that helped out a, a young lady who was having car problem, and they posted that, and were like, look at this guy, you know, helping the community. And, um, and they're also out there just to, you know, to make sure that, um, you know, just to make sure everything's on the up and up and to let, you know, law enforcement know that, that uh, the public's watching. I think that's a great idea. I actually suggested such about uh, 10 years ago that uh, we should uh, keep cameras on every cop and and so that uh, if they ever do anything good or bad, especially bad, uh, to be quite honest with you, that uh, 
they would be uh, on uh, re- on the record and uh, be held accountable. Uh, I'm talking about even, uh, and really what I was uh, addressing at the time uh, was uh, traffic violations. And I believe that cops violate traffic laws routinely and then turn right around and uh, uh, cite uh, common ordinary citizens for the same thing that cops do uh, just to go, you know, to get home for uh, lunch or to get to the donut shop or uh, to to go run an errand or whatever, you know, whatever they're doing. Uh, technically, if they ever go e- exceeding the speed limit, they have to have lights and siren on, uh, and that's the law. And uh, then to be able to do that, it requires an emergency. And uh, so, uh, and I know from personal experience, I did it, you know, um, that uh, we would exceed the the speed limit and, and do other things, not use our uh, turn signal um, or follow too closely or uh, roll through red lights or stop signs, um, just when we were doing normal routine stuff. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I, I thought of that before, and, and I thought, you know, if, if we're going to expose hypocrisy in government, then uh, I think that's one of the places to start. Well, that thought might have taken 10 years to mature, but we got off in peaceful streets right now. And um, so what, that has constitutional standing, right? That's freedom of the press. Or, or where would you see that fit in, you know, our right uh, to police what, the police? Whatever it is, anybody in public is fair game. And, uh, you know, they try to, uh, I don't know where they did it. I can't remember where they did it. But they actually arrested somebody for filming cops and it didn't hold up. Uh, Once the cop puts the uniform on, he is a public employee. Anything he does in public is for public uh, purview, and uh, it's just too bad. Uh, I'll tell any cop, uh, any chief or sheriff knows that uh, they are public officials. Um, You know, they can have ride-along programs where the public watches what they do. They can have the press go along with them. They certainly can't stop the press from filming whatever a cop does in public. And uh, if they can't stop the press from doing it, they certainly can't stop you and me or anybody else. We can do whatever we want to in public. We can film. We can watch. uh, We can take pictures. uh, And the cops should know uh, that they are fair game. And I don't care what constitutional right you call it. Uh, they are fair game, and they know it. Right. Well, go ahead, Rick. Nope, I was just agreeing. Very well said. Yeah, one one of the things that we've been seeing out there in the last – see, this thing's all new, right? You know, Antonio Beeler, that incident happened in um, on New Year's Eve, but then the, a snowball happened. And somehow he raised a, a huge sum of money, and about four weeks ago, you know, he hit his goal and hauled 250 people into this one venue in Austin and gave away 100 cameras. And there was probably about what it looked like to me, about 20 veteran camera people, you know, private individuals that had equipment and already knew what was going on. You could pick them out of a crowd. Um, so... For the last, I'd say, what is it, three or four weeks, Rick? How long has it been? Yeah, it's been about that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've been constantly documenting what's going on, their, their progression of you know developing the server, all the procedures and, and whatnot of how to deal with it. You know, Antonio went to the city city council meeting, and you can, you can find this YouTube, you know, up there on the net. Um, but he went there and said, here, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it, and I just want to let you know we're not in a negative place here. We just want the facts. And so they're building this system, but they're facing a little bit of kickback right now. The officers uh, either come up with this tactic on their own or they're talking to each other about it, but they're shining flashlights at the camera lens, and we have one incident just recently with, you know, pulling horses in front of the, the cameraman. I, I believe that's, um, I forgot the guy's name, Comrade. Comrade was Comrade. involved with that one. But I look at that as almost uh, destruction of evidence. You know, am I 
far off by saying, you know, by actively shining a flashlight on an, a camera that is recording an issue? Or, I know you're not a lawyer. <laughs> I don't want to. Well, I'm not, but it's a, it's still a, a, a matter of common sense. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you can't put hidden ca cameras inside a police station or inside a police car. But you can put them on your property or ask to put them on anybody else's property or you can put them uh, anyplace else in public, I guess, that, uh, you know, can't, they can't be in restrooms uh, or anything like that or invade uh, otherwise places that uh, one would normally expect privacy. But, uh, you know, if you, if you put up a camera uh, that wasn't uh, impeding uh, the view of traffic, uh, of, ve of vehicles or or pedestrian traffic, uh, and, you know, you made it motion sensitive or whatever, um, go for it, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the cops the, the cops have got to keep their own noses clean. And the, if, if, they are, if they're not doing anything stupid and, and committing crimes, they don't have anything to worry about. Uh, it, it's just, uh, like I said before, it's just too bad. If they don't want to be a cop, uh, they don't be a cop. But uh, once you're in public, uh, you know you're fair game. Sorry. So uh, hey, any of that's I... any of that's there. And uh, also, I don't know. Uh, did you get any of my uh, colleagues on? Did you get Sheriff Christopher on or anybody else? I think Christopher, you know, tried to call in right after you, and I was trying. I didn't know you guys were hanging there. I was. In, um, yeah, caught up in the conversation. But, yeah, I was going to ask you, can I switch subject on you, and maybe you can talk to me a little bit of what's going on with the CSPOA and um, Sheriff Christopher right now. I'll try to give him a call tomorrow, but maybe you can give us well, an update. We've, we've donated uh, uh, quite a bit of money to uh, Sheriff Christopher's battle, and, and uh, his is probably the most important uh, battle to protect a, an existing sheriff that I've ever seen uh, in a long time. And uh, uh, we certainly hope that he, he prevails in his battle to protect his office and to protect his family. Uh, he's being attacked immensely from all sides. Uh, the county uh, commissioners are attacking him, and the state is attacking him, and the attorney general is attacking him, and, and the office of the sheriff. And, and Sheriff Christopher is uh, mounting a very courageous challenge to um, the unconstitutional acts of these local officials. And uh, he knows and understands the authority of the sheriff and knows and understands the oath of office. And just like we've been pushing within the CSPOA, the Constitutional Sheriff, uh, Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, the CSPOA, and um, we, we want all your listeners uh, to get involved in this process. Uh, we're having our uh, second convention uh, on September 17th, which, as you know, is uh, Constitution Day, and we're we're celebrating the Constitution with the constitutional guards of our country, and we're trying to raise enough money to pull this con uh, convention off. Uh, we're we're getting uh, a lot of sheriffs saying, "Look, uh, I just can't afford to be there this time," and uh, so they're looking for scholarships from us. And quite frankly, uh, everyone listening to your program could help us provide those scholarships. Uh, it costs two hundred ninety nine dollars for one sheriff to attend um, and, and then plus uh, travel expenses but if we can get there if we can get everybody to just donate five or ten bucks at our cspoa dot org website mm -hmm. that's cs dot org uh, we could get hundreds of sheriffs there and if we have hundreds of constitutional sheriffs in this country, just think what that will mean for the holy cause of liberty and mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I just, I just really hope that people will see the necessity of getting involved in this process, and it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it might be, uh, in fact, I believe that it is exactly what my book says, the county sheriff, America's last hope. Well, if this is our last hope, we better get busy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious as to see <laughs> what, um, see what the difference is as I talk to, you know sheriffs and, and police officers and then ones that are uh, constitutional sheriffs or at least consider themselves constitutional sheriffs, if they align with your view on the whole Police Accountability Act. Because, you know, so 
let me give you a hypothetical. You know, you're still sheriff in, in a county, and then all of a sudden this thing happened in Beeler and, and whatnot shows up in your town. How would you have dealt with it? Just said, okay. No, we, we, no. Well, you know, it, it depends on first if it was my office that did the arrest. If it was my okay. office that did the arrest, uh, I, I could have... Uh, I would have put a kibosh on it right then and there. If it was another agency and he came to me and I would have just said, uh, please bring, bring me the police reports, and then I would have reviewed the police reports and then gone to the uh, prosecutors and said, look, the, this was not a, an appropriate arrest, and if I have to, I'll testify for the guy in court. Um, yeah, I guess, I, I guess yeah. I'm not asking that question. I'm, I'm asking the question of the... Uh, the peaceful streets organization coming to your town and just forget, you know, how it got given birth. Oh, right. You know, all of a sudden. Hey, I tell them. I tell them they can ride along with our cops if they want to. Uh, you know, they can do whatever they want, as long as they're not right. breaking the law. You know, they can. Uh, I want my cops to to. Uh, I want my officers and deputies to believe. Look, you're being watched out there. Everybody has a right. cell phone, camera. Uh, you better be towing the line. You better be doing your job. You better be professional, uh, cussing at citizens. I mean, uh, I, I was always trained, and I always trained my deputies. Look, these guys, these suspects, these uh, what we call dirtbags out there that we're dealing with, they can they can be rude to you. They can talk about your mother, your daughter, your wife, and all you get to say in return is, have a good day, sir. Uh, have a good day, sir. Uh, we maintain our professionalism. We don't allow them to bring us down to their level. And uh, no matter what, we maintain our professional demeanor. We maintain our command presence. And we do our job. And to allow some dirtbag or suspect or drunk uh, to get you to uh, lower your standards, lower your guard, uh, to, to uh, pronounce profanities at somebody uh, who's out on the street uh, flipping you off or, or yelling profanities at you, uh, to try to retaliate in any way is absolutely unprofessional, unbecoming an officer, and uh, it should not be tolerated by any chief or sergeant or, or supervisor or sheriff anywhere in the United States. should not happen. And to arrest somebody to, uh, to show them who the boss is, because you have the badge and you have the gun to misuse to misuse your authority and power and to uh, take away somebody's liberty, uh, even if it's for a short time. But for an officer to take away somebody's liberty just to show them who's boss and to make a pride arrest, those things have no place in law enforcement or anywhere in a sheriff's office. Nowhere. Right. Hey, another question. What's the thin blue line? Well, the the thin blue line is where each officer kind of takes care of himself, you know, and and the thin blue line is backing each other up, uh, even if it means uh, crossing the line. And uh, the thin blue line should not exist. Uh, no officer should be needing another officer to lie for him or to take care of him uh, because it should never be needed. And when our officers break the law, they should be held to a higher standard, not a lower one. So uh, th those types yeah. of things should not even exist. Yeah, I just um, – how is that usually taken out there in the, the police force? Um, I guess some people like that concept. Is it a bad concept? Is it looked at darkly? Or I, I've heard it throughout my life, and until yesterday I, I never really did any research on it, and I'm still – don't understand it from not being in the law enforcement. Um, do they use it to embolden each other's bad behavior? Um, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's that's what it is used for. No question about it. I didn't it. want and, to hear you say that. You know, well, that's what it's for. But uh, I don't like it, and uh, I I will tell you, I've never participated in it. Um, you know, I I've turned I I've turned in officers who uh, I saw hit uh, citizens that uh, an arrestees when it was not necessary and I never did it uh, and I didn't participate in uh, any uh, excessive force against citizens 
and uh, it's not necessary, it's not right, uh, and uh, any officer that does it should be brought to task for it. Hmm. Hey, did um, have you heard anything about uh, Sheriff Mills? Is he planning on attending this um, the convention that's coming up? Your latest CSPOA. I, I haven't heard from I haven't heard from him, and I doubt that he wants to. But uh, people like you need to call him and ask him and see if he's going, because I'm not going to do it. If he wants to come, he can. But uh, citizens need to call him and say, "Hey, we sure would like you to go. What uh, uh, what is what is it? What is your plan?" of action regarding the uh, CSPOA conference. Uh, every citizen needs to ask your sheriff, wherever you are, Sheriff Hamilton over in uh, Austin uh, and any other sheriff across the state of Texas or any other sheriff across the uh, United States. Make sure all of you are calling your sheriff and ask him to attend. Hey, how is Sheriff Hamilton over in Austin? Did you ever get to, to meet him? Yes, I did. I had uh, several conversations with him at the uh, Texas Sheriff's Association convention. Uh, he's a very friendly guy. Uh, I got along with him great, and I hope he's going to attend. And uh, anybody over there needs to call him and ask him to attend. Mm. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Sounds so anyway, i got to run. I've got to get some homework done uh, on this uh, convention. And uh, I'm kind of far behind on some things here, so... Uh, you got, I got your email, and, and you asked me to commit, call in, and uh, so uh, I thank you for that. And, okay, great. Uh, appreciate the time. I have another great. I have another caller, so I'm going to let you go as fast as you want to go. Thank you. Okay, appreciate thanks it. a lot. Richard yeah. okay. Talk to you soon. Okay, see you later. Okay, I'm pushing the button. Do I got a caller from the 302 area code? That's uh, the Sheriff Christopher from Delaware. Ah, Sheriff Christopher, thank you for joining us. Yeah, you, know, you hear the, that last little bit? Uh, yes, I did. I heard a, a little bit from uh, from Sheriff Back, um, and I think I came in just about the time uh, when you were talking about the thin blue line. Hmm. Yeah. I, tonight, uh, my co-host is is Rick. He's from uh, Veterans Against Police Abuse. He's a um, his organization is about monitoring. Um, police activity and increasing the ability to monitoring. Kind of one of our big topics tonight has been a, a program that's been going on in Austin called the Peaceful Streets. And they've gathered just normal people and they're going around and in teams and filming police stops and they, you know, upload stuff that's notable. And so I really wanted to get the opinions from law enforcement agents and and whatnot as to what they would think. Now, you're the sheriff in Delaware, is that correct? Yes, Sussex County, Delaware is correct. Okay. So let me start with this question before we start going all over the place, if you don't mind me asking you a few questions here. Go right ahead. Okay. What's your thoughts about um, just normal people filming police stops it's in a constitutional, you know, reality, you know, or just you today. You know, if somebody comes up and they start to get their iPhone and they start filming them, what do you think about that or, or your deputies? Well, my first thought is um, I, I'm sorry that people feel that they have to do that because of, uh, of the situations that have developed in the last 10, 20 years with the police. Um, there's, uh, I believe there has developed a, a small percentage of the police, uh, part of the police forces out here that uh, do cross the line. And um, you had situations back in the 70s like uh, in New York City with Serpico, uh, if you remember that book. Uh -huh. um, Serpico was an officer that uh, basically he was a whistleblower for some corruption that was going on in his department, and uh, he feared for his life and had to be protected. Uh, because of what he overturned uh, as far as the, the proverbial rock, if you will. And uh, I feel bad that there's police officers out there uh, that are like that because they take an oath. And when they take that oath, um, we need to take that as police officers. We need to take that very seriously. And we need to remember uh, each and every time, not just when we're on duty, but when we're off duty as well, we have to uh, set an example for people uh, that 
if 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 it were possible to be above reproach, uh, so that people can trust us uh, 24/7. And unfortunately, um, we in the world have become, uh, how should I say, relaxed in so many ways as far as ethics are concerned uh, that. We have to have uh, people looking after us and looking over our shoulders and uh, whistleblowers, if you will, and uh, that's unfortunate. But I know it's a reality of the day, uh, of the modern day, and the policing sense. And uh, I believe if people, uh, if police officers were trained uh, constitutionally or more concentrated in the constitutional sense about the rights of people, and of course sensitivity. Uh, to cultures, um, to, uh, to ethnic, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic groups, and things that, that we have to encounter every day. Um, I think if they they had the type of training that made them sensitive to those things, there'd be a lot less need for people to have to look out uh, out there with cameras and look out over the shoulders of police. Uh, I believe we could recollect some of those trusts, but uh, I don't think it really matters. Uh, whether you're a police officer or not, uh, when you take an oath, uh, if you're if you're uh, a military uh, member of the military, for instance, um, it, you you still have a pastor of a church. He has a responsibility to be a a certain level of tr to hold a certain level of trust to the people that he serves, uh, or she, and uh, we just simply should not violate those things. And, and I'm not saying that they're perfect. No one's perfect. But uh, you know we have to do the best that we can and strive a little harder out here to let people know that we can be trusted as law enforcement officials out there that people entrust. And that's one of the reasons that, that I take the oath that serious that I that I did. Um, no doubt many people have heard my name before across the United States as a sheriff and what I'm fighting right now. But uh, I have a government, uh, a complete government that's against me. Uh, for simply wanting to adhere to the oath that I took. Um, this may be unethical to many people, and in the eyes of the conservative, the true conservative, it looks like uh, something's being covered up. And uh, I simply just don't like that kind of uh, an attitude and position from any government official or any, any entity of government. We should not cover anything up to the people. We should be truly revealing of ourselves and of our policies and of our practice and one other thing I might add in, uh, with that question is I think we have lost touch with the people. Um, recently in the, in the 90s, uh, latter part of the 80s and the 90s, they instituted a program called uh, 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 community policing, which really, and in essence, the, the police should be involved with every day. And what it intended to do was to put the police officer back in touch with the voice of the people and the desire of the people in a particular neighborhood to be sensitive to the things that I mentioned to you before, uh, cultures and ethnicities and all the different ways of, of, of life that people uh, have in their, in their particular neighborhoods. I believe police officers should be in touch with those things, and we should put uh, more training uh, to the police officers to let them. Uh, and of course, you have. There's a value of, uh, of how should I say, attitude um, in, a, in a police officer when they become an officer. It shouldn't be an arrogant attitude. It should be an honorable attitude that they get to serve the public as they do. And of course, holding that trust is the, the difficult part of it. Um, an officer mm. or an individual should hold that trust 100% uh, to his, uh, his uh, heart and make sure that he stays uh, on the uh, on the upper part of that and trusting the community. Right, the Constitution, you know, helps us, all, you know, balance that. So, as far as cameras go, you'd you'd probably support that as a um, a mechanism for increased training or to show, you know, how your well, offices. The departments have instituted uh, camera programs in the cars uh, mm -hmm. uh, probably within the last in, in my in my area over here in the last 15 years some form of camera has been placed in fact I remember uh, the first time they came out with the cameras uh, I happened to be a chief of police in Maryland at the time and it was simply a camera a small palm uh, well actually it wasn't really that small um, it was rather big at the time back in the 80s we had a camera that was mounted on a 
on a steel rod coming up out of the console that had a uh, a VHS tape, you know, in the side of the camera, and the camera was filming the traffic stop the entire you know the entire uh, uh, time that the officer was on patrol, and it was rigged so that whenever the officer turned the lights on in the car, the camera began to be recorded and turned off when the lights were turned off. But uh, mm. The, the departments themselves and the agencies themselves saw a need to use them as uh, training mechanisms uh, as well as uh, looking over the shoulder of the officer uh, as well. I mean, let's call it, let's call it what it is. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, times when time management becomes an issue and what have you. You have to take a look at those things and make sure the officer is doing uh, procedurally uh, what he's been trained to do. And the supervisor looks at an officer and says, okay, you, you know, you he can scrutinize a move that the officer made that's uh, rather dangerous. Um, look on YouTube, uh, the repeated uh, times when we have an officer approaching a car that could be uh, scrutinized in a training uh, format that says, well, you didn't grab the trunk or you didn't walk up the car to the car properly. Uh, a nighttime stop dictates a completely different scenario. You know, did you follow that procedure? Uh, that's something that can be used to make sure that the officer is uh, safety-wise is staying on the side of good judgment and dealing with the public is no different. Right. Steve, do you mind if I uh, interject? Dude, go for it. Hey, Sheriff. Uh, this is Rick. I uh, really appreciate you talking to us. And um, I had a question. You mentioned uh, taking the oath to the Constitution seriously, and that's something that I've, uh, I've pondered quite a bit. And I try to put my finger on why it is that individuals who have raised their right hand don't actually follow through. Um, and in my ponderings, I've thought part of it's because they don't really study history, they don't understand why America is special, why the liberties that are in our Constitution are special, so it's not real to them. Um, but then on the other hand, a lot of times I think it's just character. No amount of training can, can, can replace, you know, not having the character necessary. What do you think about that? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, character is developed throughout the, the, the childhood of, a, of a, you know, an officer. As he's growing up and, and you know, he's 8 or 9 or 10 years old, uh, oftentimes uh, you know, we see today in, in modern society they don't have a father figure or the father figure is not there. Uh, the, the schools don't teach them about the Constitution anymore. Um, they don't go in there and sit down and learn about what the Constitution means. Um, you know, for crying out loud, the schools are are, are teaching our kids, uh, you know, things that are anti-American as far as I'm concerned. Um, they need to listen and pay attention because, you know, uh, the, the, the rule of thumb is you don't shoot yourself in the foot, and that's what America is doing with, it, with its uh, students of the day. You know, we're teaching our kids and, and dulling them down. Uh, I don't know if you want to, um, you know, how you want to label it or what have you, but if you teach them unconstitutional things or the lack of constitutional things are not in their repertoire and is not in their training, is not in their daily exposure, they're not going to be sensitive to those things. They're not going to pay attention to those things. And that in itself is going to develop an arrogance because arrogance in my opinion, is something that fills a void of unknowledge. When you're arrogant about something, arrogant about something you either uh, don't know about something and you use an attitude to fill it or to fill those times because you can't answer it uh, in an intellectual way. Um, I'm judging myself when I say that because there's many times that I've been in that situation. And you have no other uh, uh, emotion uh, than arrogance uh, really, especially embarrassment, when embarrassment comes and you're wearing a badge out there in a uniform, uh, every officer goes through this. And I'm not, I'm not downing any officer. I'm just simply stating the, the matter of fact, the truth. Um, every officer can do himself a favor by educating himself on what his constitutional role is and what his uh, procedural role is. If an officer knows it by the book, starting with the Constitution and going right through the procedures, uh, you have ten times the officer. In fact, you know those guys. Every officer knows those guys in the department. You know, those guys stand out like a sore thumb because they advance. Uh, they, they've got uh, the fire and the, and, and the, uh, the vigor that goes uh, to, do, to basically to, to serve to push them right up the ladder. Uh, they do well. The problem you have 
oftentimes later in the career of some of those officers is they go awry by going along to get along politics. They adopt some other way that they compromise. And when they compromise uh, something they've learned and understood, uh, you know, such as in the Serpico case, if you've ever read the book again, uh, you can see where at some point those guys went wrong. Uh, and they knew what they were doing was wrong because just simply having a person stand up and say, uh, you know, tattletailing, if you will, is what they called it, uh, this guy was basically simply stating this, the, the truth about what was going on and comparing it to what should be going on and what wasn't going on. And uh, it, it activated the guilt system uh, throughout that department. Of course, the guilt system then in turn activated the anger and uh, retaliate, uh, the retaliatory system that came in that they wanted to kill this guy for, for standing up and saying such a thing. Um, again, the arrogance was turned on because they didn't have anything else to fill or any other motion to fill those voids when they knew they were wrong to begin with. Um, I think we as people are built by God himself uh, to act on certain things and treat people uh, in a way that's respectful, and uh, the knowledge is absolutely paramount to that. Mm, so it requires more studying and focus by the individual. Can character actually be instilled in people? I had a friend of mine actually tell me that you know character was instilled in the early years and once those early years are gone a person doesn't change it's a matter of characters now I don't necessarily believe that but I'm kind of curious as to both of you what are your thoughts on it well I think uh, Frederick did go ahead go ahead I'm sorry Frederick Douglass Oh, yeah, the, uh, you know, just brought a quote to mind from uh, Frederick Douglass that uh, I recently read uh, where he said it's easier to build good children than to rebuild broken men. Um, I, so I tend, to, I tend to also agree. I think character is something that's uh, instilled. And, again, for me, it's a, it's a matter of values. And specifically with the Constitution, people have to value it. It's not just, you know, can they memorize it or or have they been taught about it, but more importantly, it's why is the Constitution special? You know, there's some people who don't know anything about it, and then there are, you know, educated people who do know, who dismiss it because, you know, it was penned by people who owned slaves. You know, they weren't perfect Unpopular. because the Constitution, yeah, the Constitution itself isn't perfect, and those are all absolutely true. However, it's still a beautiful document, and it, it embodies what America really is and should be, and there's a reason why it's important. If you look at history and you see the tyranny, freedom does not grow on trees. It's not really a natural state. And so, you know, we have something that's very special, um, and so we should all value it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, be it, you know, people who have raised their right hands or just regular citizens, you know, I don't see that value anymore. Hmm. But that's... That's well said. Um, and if you look at our military system in the United States, um, I, I believe that has a lot to do with the position that society has on it. And, of course, if you look at the Marine Corps, for instance, uh, look at the honor and the prestige that is wrapped around the idea of being a Marine. Uh, kids, my son uh, right now is looking at going into the Marine Corps. And... Uh, when he looks at the Marine Corps, he sees a, a step above uh, what the average citizen sees or what the average citizen becomes. He wants to be, you know, uh, the few, the proud, the Marines. It's, an even, it's even in their, their statement and their dec the declaration that they have about themselves. Um, society has to make the declaration that the Constitution is important and then, of course, expect that of our government. If our government abandons that idea and the people don't bring that back to uh, notability, then people themselves, the society themselves, will develop a, a, uh, a more shallow, a more hollow or clear system of there is no, uh, there's nothing that you can attach yourself to as far as what this country was built on and what we founded ourselves on, and, and namely religion. Um, myself as a Christian, I, I wrap uh, all my beliefs and my understanding around the Holy Bible and, and who God is to me. And we as a country have that same value system. Uh, that's why we're incensed when someone 
condemns us uh, for what we believe in. Uh, this is something that we have to reinstill in, in the United States of America, and we have to put that back into our school systems because that's where the ears and eyes are picking it up. Uh, and that is our future. If we don't demand of our teachers, we don't demand of our school system, we don't demand of our government, that's local government, state government, federal government, all of those things that uh, we had. Uh, and, and nothing's ever going to be lined up perfectly. You know, everybody has a right to their own opinion. But in the same token, um, you know, we as a republic, we, we depend on the majority rule, and yet uh, we listened because of the media. We tolerate this, this uh, wayward media that uh, I believe, for instance, uh, there was one guy, I think his name was Bill something, that uh, said that you know, he was incensed that we had in God we trust on the money. Well, who cares what this guy says? You know, he's one person and, and, and maybe a few of his followers that are going to tell 99% of the rest of America that it's something that you know, we shouldn't do. This is the kind of thing we've got to get away from. We've got to go back to teaching the basics of what is important in the country. Uh, and, and, and it all comes down to this, how we treat our brothers and sisters okay. out here. Person would, to person, you know, face I would, to face. I would... Uh, I would disagree with you on just one thing there, and the only reason I bring it up is because I think it's kind of an interesting dichotomy a little bit. But the, uh, the belief of that uh, America is a foundation, is somehow a Christian foundation, I would disagree with that. But at the same time, I do notice that people who are passionate about the Constitution tend to be people who identify themselves as Christians. And the other thing I, I would, would offer is, and I, I use this phrase all the time, America needs a revival. Like in the worst way, we need a revival. And I'm actually meaning that to refer to the fervor of, you know, Billy Sunday and the revivals, uh, you know, in the earlier days of America. Even though I myself am not religious, that, that fervor, that passion, that uh, the value system, the ethics, you know, I don't believe it's tied to religion, but, um, but we still have to have the ethics. It's just a matter of how do we get there. How do we value oh, America? I tie it because uh, the original uh, the original law of, of morality came from the Ten Commandments, and everybody knows that it's wrong to murder someone because the Ten Commandments said it was wrong to murder. Uh, that goes along with every other thing that is wrong and, and dedicated to be wrong. Uh, it's called common law in, in America. Uh, we all know it's wrong because it came from somewhere, and the Bible says, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. All those things we know uh, in, our, in our heart of hearts, you know, one level to another, uh, one person may not adopt that particular belief system, but it still origins itself, you know, in the oldest text that we know, that we can gather this fact, this, this, these facts and these uh, ideas from, is it's wrong to do certain things against your brother. Um, the first four commandments uh, tell us about how we're treat to to re respond to God, and the last uh, six are, are to each other, one man to another. And if those are not the original set of ethics, then uh, I'm at a loss to explain why uh, ethics exist to begin with and where it came from. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hey, well, I'll step in there and argue and say that we are in that revival. You know, because a lot of people are talking about the, you know, constitution and ethics and morality. And, you know, the whole thing is, you know, Antonio uh, Beeler, when he stopped, you know, on New Year's Eve and he saw something going on with, you know, his sister, his, you know, her fellow human being across the street, he didn't walk away and say, you know, what the, whatever. I don't care what happened in that situation between Antonio and the police officer. He saw something was wrong and he stepped up and he did it, right? Um, a lot of people would have turned their back on what they suspect was, you know, something going wrong and they just, you know, sit there. But there's a lot of people that are willing to put themselves in um, as being their brother's keeper, for the lack of better words. And I think that's part of the revival. You know, you're definitely part of the revival as you sit there and fight the state and try to um, keep the powers of the sheriff, 
in your state. You know, they've how many? It's been like 200 years. There's been a sheriff who has been the only law enforcement agency. It's enumerated throughout um, your the documents, right? And so that was the whole problem that you yeah, were going 16, through, right? Huh? 1669. Yeah, it was the originating date of the sheriff, uh, so far as we can tell in Delaware. Yep. Right, and so now all of a sudden you're going to be the last law enforcement sheriff there is. Did the governor, see, I, I lost track of the story a few months back, and the last th thing I remember is the, gov the document was sitting on the governor's desk to be signed. Did he sign that? He did. Or on the June the 19th, he signed it, and it became law that the sheriff uh, has no arrest authority uh, whatsoever, despite what common law dictates, despite what the Constitution says. Uh, they try to go on the premise that um, the conservator of the peace, and it's ironic because uh, it describes the, the sheriff in the Constitution as the conservator of the peace. It says that he shall be the conservator of the peace. And, of course, in law, you know when the word shall is used, because it's a non-discretion. You have to do it. And uh, it also says that the attorney general, the judges, and the chancellor which is a form of judge, uh, being the chancellor, uh, shall be the conservators of the peace as well. Now, the, the state says that the conservator of the peace does not mean, uh, does not give arrest powers, uh, although all of those entities, uh, the judges and the, the attorney general, have those arrest powers. Uh, they simply don't understand um, the government itself, which which is really, really strange to me because here these guys are in the profession of government and they don't understand uh, the commission itself and how it's given. Um, it's interpreted time after time after time after time throughout the United States and in common law that the term conservator of the peace simply does mean uh, to one who conserves the peace has been given the authority to conserve the peace. And if it's not, if it's not good enough in the Constitution, then it certainly wouldn't be good enough in state law to give uh, a sheriff that role and responsibility. And um, I might also add that where it says that he shall be the conservator of the peace, it also says the same thing in the state law uh, about the Delaware State Police. It says the Delaware State Police shall be the conservators of peace throughout the state. So they understand. Uh, this is just a, a play on words. It's a head game. It's a word game. Uh, I think they they have just like uh, government has become corrupt around the country. Uh, this is the type of corruption that they have. They deny their own. Uh, you know, when it comes when it comes to uh, you know defining the sheriff, they can't they can't reach out and see and try to find another excuse. So they have to say, well, conservative of the peace is too big. Um, you know, they've defined it themselves. That being the state legislature, had defined it themselves when they gave the state police the title as oh, conservators of the peace. In fact, before 2007, Governor Minner um, proposed a law uh, from another sheriff in 2006, his name was Bob Reed, that tried to uh, uh, basically uh, make it clear to the state and to the county that the sheriff was a police officer and did have powers of arrest. Uh, f for purposes of defining that same thing. Unfortunately, it didn't get very far, but that governor responded and reacted to his attempts by changing the statute that I just referred to, and I think it's in Title 11, uh, Section 8302, if I'm not mistaking it. It's basically the definition and power of the state police. And it said at the time, the state police shall be the conservators of peace throughout the state, they shall have police authority, similar to those of sheriffs, constables, and other police officers in the state. <laughs> they changed it by taking the word sheriff out of it, out of that definition. Mm -hmm. And I guess they think that by taking the word out, it changes the definition of sheriff, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It just simply uh, leaves a blank and a question mark in everybody's head, you know, why they would take it out, what would it be their motivating factor, if it were not politically motivated to undermine the office of sheriff and in turn undermine the voice of the people. And that's bottom line. Wow. So basically, where do you sit right now? We're running a little short on time. I, I, I could talk to you for a lot longer. I have so many questions. So it's been signed. You must have an appeal out there, or, you're, or what are you doing? 
Uh, I have filed a lawsuit, and uh, we're going to sh attempt to show where this law, House Bill 325, that was passed and signed, is unconstitutional uh, uh, in its in its uh, core value and, and in the words itself. Um, you can't a state legislator cannot create a state law that supersedes a constitutional charge uh, simply by passing a law. They have to amend the Constitution. And there's certain values attached to that. Uh, two-thirds majority, two separate houses, uh, you know, two cycles have to go through, and it has to be, you know, it's almost a, a major, major, major deal to get that done. And they didn't go about it that way. Um, mm -hmm. If the people of Delaware, uh, if they think, are so ready to get rid of their sheriff, uh, one of the things that we have to do is educate the people in Delaware what the role of the sheriff is and what he's supposed to be doing constitutionally to protect their rights, much as what uh, Sheriff Mack endured in Arizona. Uh, most of you know that with Prince versus the U.S. in 1998 and, uh, and then the declaration of the judge in that case stating that the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer in the county. So we have to reestablish that and reeducate. But in the meantime, I have sued, and I'm trying to raise money. Um, you know, I hate to always put out there, you know, fundraising uh, notifications because uh, I know people come, you know, come by their dollars uh, very hard and difficult in, in these times. But uh, it's time for us, you know, the ones who are, are given this charge to stand up together in some form or another. Everybody has a different, uh, uh, you know, instrument to play uh, in this band. But I think that we all should look at this for its, its basic reasoning. Um, if the federal government wanted to overreach down into the county, all they need do is get rid of the sheriff, and they're free to do so. Uh, again, let me reiterate to the Mac case, um, Second Amendment rights would have been pushed upon and forced into uh, Graham County, Arizona, had Sheriff Mac not stood up and sued the federal government. Enough said on that. But uh, that's, that's anything that, that the federal government or state government or county government does to usurp the rights of people. Property rights, liberties, freedoms, anything. We got some and, problems, don't we? Yes, we do. No, oh, God. Yes, we do. Hey, where do, I, where do I send listeners to um, find out more about um, your plight? Do you have a website set up nowadays? Well, they can certainly uh, contact CSPOA, uh, as Richard Mack said. Uh, we are on there, um, as he is one of our one of our partners in this uh, endurance, and uh, they can also go directly to the site to donate directly. Um, it it is a uh, Liberty Foundation, or I'm sorry, Legacy Foundation. Um, it's all one word, and it's Legacy Foundation dot us forward slash Sussex, which is the county for which I work. Uh, S U S S E X, just like Sussex, England, mm -hmm. and uh, they can go on there and donate five bucks, ten bucks, uh, if they have a mind to do so. Uh, it is certainly appreciated, and uh, hopefully we can uh, push this thing backwards. It has a, it has a potential to spread across the country because of this reason uh, that they have challenged the actual arrest authority of the sheriff. Nowhere has it ever been challenged before in the United States. Now, types of arrests and types of investigations have been challenged in Pennsylvania and other states, but never, never has it ever been challenged the actual arrest authority of a sheriff. A constitutionally elected, duly elected uh, sheriff, they're, and they're saying that we don't have any powers of arrest at all, which means they say that the people have no voice because that's what the sheriff, that's what the sheriff does is he works for the people. Mm. Hey, um, we're coming up on three minutes left. Hey, Rick, do you want to close us out here? Do you have any closing thoughts? Or should I give that over to Jeffrey Christopher? Well, um, either one. Uh, but I w what I would say is, uh, you know, we, we, we need a revival. People have got to look inward, and they got to understand what America is. Um, if they don't know, you know, they were just born into this wonderful country, you know, fueled by debt, everything's hunky-dory, never really thought about it. Well, now is the time to think about it. Think about what is America? Why is it special? Why is it different? You know, why did the founders risk? Why did people sacrifice, you know, both people in uniform and people during the Civil Rights Movement? Why did so many Americans sacrifice and risk so much for this country? 
why is it special? We need a revival. We've got to remember what makes America, America. Mm. Hey, you're on, Christopher. <laughs> well, I would say this. Um, yes, we do. We, de we need a, re a revival. Uh, we need to educate ourselves. And, uh, and I'm not talking about a long, drawn-out kind of education. You can do this in, in days uh, by looking at some of the things that are being said. Anybody who's skeptical out there, uh, research the word sheriff and see what uh, uh, there's a there's a website out there called Amicus Dash Curious, and that's one of our attorneys that uh, we have, and his his name is Carson Tucker, and he does research and litigation on uh, just these types of cases, and you will see uh, basically what his research has revealed, and if it's not clear to you. Uh, you know, I'll eat your socks because uh, it's very simple and basic and to the point, and it gives the authority and the power back to the people. And that means every person who reads it, no matter what side you're on and what you believe, it's still their authority. And uh, if they want to shoot themselves in the foot and say the sheriff doesn't have this kind of authority, uh, basically uh, it's undermining themselves. And uh, that's dangerous for America. America's on fire. And uh, we don't need to be sitting still and waiting for our own house to catch on fire to realize that it's a danger um, all over the country. Right. Okay, I'm going to agree with both of them. A, Rick, thank you for coming on the show. Sheriff Christopher, thank you. Yes, we need a revival. You guys support Jeffrey Christopher. Look into what's going on with him. I implore you. Um, I'll email you later on this week. Perhaps we can do something again there, uh, Sheriff Christopher. It'd be my pleasure, and I thank you for the opportunity to talk. And it was nice uh, going over the things with you tonight. I think it needs to be uh, done every night. Um, shame we can't right. get on a major news station and, and uh, tout this every night so people can hear it. We can amplify it a tad bit anyway, so let's get <laughs> working. <laughs> That's good. Okay, you guys, have a good Thank night you for your work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. God bless you.